Hello and welcome to the future of hypertension management, another treatment option. My name is Dr. Alan Fong from Sarawak Center, Malaysia. And uh, hello, Alan. I'm uh, Dr. Li Yingsheng from Taipei McKay Memorial Hospital. Uh, it's my pleasure here to uh, share our experience and the latest information about renal innovation. And the first part will be taken by Alan, please. Thank you. Hypertension remains a leading preventable cause of heart attack, stroke, and death. More than 50% of patients are not at blood pressure goal despite ready available and effective drugs. Medication remains a significant issue and some patients are intolerant or do not want to take daily medicines. Renal denervation or RDN could help address those unmet needs as an adjunctive approach to lowering blood pressure. The incidence of hypertension is high globally. And as you know, the prevalence of, hy of hypertension is over 30% worldwide majority of them affecting developing countries. In the Spiral HDN Global Clinical Program, we explore the merits of the different evidence sets. The OFMED Pivotal Study looked at the scientific evidence of efficacy, the ONMED on the scientific evidence of efficacy in a more clinically relevant population, the Global Simplicity Registry on a large data set with multiple subgroups on the durability and safety of renal denervation in real world settings. Underpinning all this is a safety component that's evaluated across all studies and populations within the SPIRAL HCN clinical trial program. So for me, the RDN's BP lowering effect in a randomized sham controlled study will be discussed. And I share with you the results from the spiral HTN of MET pivotal trial. In this study, the inclusion criteria are either a patient not on antihypertensive medications or permitting discontinuation of drug therapy. Second, the office systolic blood pressure is more equal than 150 millimeters of mercury and less than 180 millimeters of mercury. The office diastolic blood pressure is equal more than 90 millimeters of mercury and a systolic 24 hour mean ADPM of more than 140 millimeters of mercury, but less than 170 millimeters of mercury. The key patient characteristics at baseline are as follows. In the RDN arm, the mean age of 54, 52.4 years, and in the sham controlled arm are the same. And they were evenly matched across both groups with an office measurement of systolic blood pressure in the RDN arm of 162 millimeters of mercury, which is similar to the sham control. The 24 hour blood pressure me measurement revealed a mean systolic blood pressure of 151 millimeters of mercury in the RDN arm and similar to that in the sham control. The safety results at three months was very favorable to the RDN, which hardly any significant major adverse events here. Ladies and gentlemen, the blood pressure change from baseline and at the primary outcome at three months are as follows. On the left-hand side, a drop of four millimeters of mercury was noted at a systolic blood pressure on an ABPM of four millimeters of mercury in the RDN arm compared to the sham control. On the right-hand graph, the office systolic blood pressure showed a 6.6 .6 millimeter of mercury difference in the RDN arm compared to the sham control. Both of these were statistically significant. And how does this translate into the clinical practice? With a drop of five millimeters of mercury on the systolic blood pressure, you could see a substantial drop in major cardiovascular disease events, stroke, heart failure, ischemic heart disease, and cardiovascular death. And this was nearly double in all these uh, variables, as you can see, at the 10 millimeter office systolic blood pressure drop, substantial differences, particularly for major cardiovascular disease events, stroke, heart failure, and cardiovascular death. In addition to this, RDN also demonstrated an always-on effect 
on 24 hour blood pressure lowering. As you can see from renal denivation on the left hand curve compared to the right hand curve on the sham control. So an always on effect at the 24 hour systolic ABPM trend at three months showed this remarkable effect. So I think from the off-med study, it is very clear that RDN works and works effectively in this group of patients within a short three month period. So in, at this point in time, I'd like to uh, uh, move on to my colleague, uh, Dr. Kenny Lee to share in his data from the Global Simplicity Registry. Before starting my part, I have several questions. Based on the inclusion criteria of uh, of med studies, the patients are actually taking no medications. So, do you think uh, it's more appropriate to have patients earlier for renal denivation, or regarding the cost-effective issue, we should use this modality later at the patient's uh, hypertension? hypertensive treatment journey. What's your comment? No, of course, uh, I think mean, these are very relevant points and the scope and the of patients that can be treated uh, with renal denervation is very broad. And I think you hit the nail right on the head in the sense that this is an, an option, another option as an anti-hypertensive treatment plan in some patients of who may be on medications who might not want to be, or in fact, they are uncontrolled eventually. In a subsequent study, uh, for example, like the on-med uh, data that is due to emerge soon. I think uh, in terms of cost effectiveness, I think that in, uh, it, there is a little argument if you apply the therapy early enough in a patient age group, which are particularly on maybe three or four medications that they will be demonstrated to have superior uh, cost effectiveness uh, than being just on pharmacotherapy alone. And uh, I will uh, turn into my part is to share the latest, largest and longest investigation on the real world about renal invasion. The studies is, uh, called Global Simplicity Registry. And about 2,800 patients are follow up uh, up to three years. And as you know, in this study, the inclusion criteria is uh, based on the authorized indication in any individual site. So most of the indications in this study are resistant hypertension. And it's not surprised that because of the uh, real world experience. So many enrollment, enrolled patients are also have multiple comorbidities such as uh, atrial fibrillation or several cardiovascular risk factors, diabetes or uh, the age uh, more than 65 years the sort of elderly. So based on this uh, subgroup uh, analysis, now we have a latest uh, study result available in Jack in 2020. And you can see on the slide, there are um, almost uh, more than 2,800 patients are already enrolled. Uh, up to three years. And the average of our office systolic blood pressure is 175. The ABPM systolic blood pressure is 157 millimeter mercury. So this slide showing that most of the patients are actually with resistant hypertension. And the ASCVD risk scores is 25% at 10 years of the uh, CV risk. And uh, their baseline number of antihypertensive medications classes are close to five. So this is a population with higher CV risk. 
and higher tablet burden. And uh, the slide showing that the BP reduction effect is consistent up to three years. If we just look at the effect at six months, the office BP reduction is around 20 millimeter mercury at six months. And regarding the ABP at six months, the average reduction of the drop pressure is eight millimeter mercury. So actually these values are quite similar and consistent with the other new uh, clinical trials, such as the OPMAT pivotal studies or the unmet uh, spiral HTN unmet study results. And this success is actually based on the background of decreasing number of antihypertensive medications and increasing proportion of hypertension control. The hypertension control rate is up to 55% at three years. And the kidney function is quite stable. Even the patient with chronic kidney disease, the EGFR is non-significant decline at three years. And here about the safety issue is once again that even after three years of follow-up, there is no any dangerous signals in this huge uh, patient population. So this is my final slide showing that so far we have experience from the resistant hypertension population from STN one, two, and three. And maybe the STN three give us an neutralized results. But based on this experience, now we still have a huge global registry study showing that uh, if renal denivation is effective and the BP reduction for resistant population is consistent uh, and durable. So I think it's quite optimized to waiting for the coming result of unmet trial. And we are also uh, happy to know that there will be uh, several studies to see the patient preference and to modify the therapeutic uh, procedure process in the near future. Thank you. I'd like to ask you, in your vast experience of performing this procedure, are there any specific uh, variables or features of the patient who would give you an indication that patient will respond the most to have a long, a biggest drop in the blood pressure? Uh, for RDM response rate, I believe everyone wants to have a higher response. And so far, I, I just can share the published data has told us that if the patient has, has higher rate, higher heart rate at baseline, they have higher uh, chance to be an RDM responder. Or uh, logically, if the patients have hypertension, the underlying puzzle phys uh, physiology is close to the spectrum of hypersympathetic activity, like uh, the young age or uh, overweight sleep apnea syndrome or even the Asian. If the patient population is close to the higher sympathetic activity, then they will have higher chance to be a RDM responder. And if the patient have a sort of structural hypertension like calcification or aging, and then maybe the patients have lower experience, uh, lower rate to be a responder. But uh, I have to emphasize that again, uh, hypertension is uh, usually multifactorial. So this is just an issue to raise our response rate. But uh, return to patients on man need, if they have difficulty in hypertension control, I think renal deprivation could always be an alternative 
or a complementary tool for hypertension uh, treatment. Thank you very much for that great insight. I think with that, uh, we thank you very much for your participation uh, in this session at the Asia PCR AICT. Have a good day.